Hi, everybody. This is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology, and I'm sitting down to take a look at the astrology for the month of November. We're going to do a big overview in this video, and then if you're new to my channel or if you've been around a while, you already know this, you can also check out your sun or rising sign horoscopes. They are grouped according to elements. You can find Cancer Scorpio Pisces or Capricorn Taurus Virgo like that. Uh, so if you want to take a look at how these transits might be influencing your chart, make sure you look at the rising sign. If you're interested in looking at the chart from the perspective of your sun, you can look at those, um, those horoscopes for your sun sign as well. Sometimes comparing the two helps. Uh, I recommend people go for the rising sign, which will give you the same whole sign house chart arrangement as your birth chart. Uh, so you can look at those separately. Today, uh, we are uh, going to talk about the astrology of November, and there's a list of transits. I always have my trusty list, so we'll be going through that uh, one by one. And as I do that, I will pull up the screen, show you an image of what it looks like, flip back, and uh, talk about it for a little bit. <clears throat> the first thing that you should know is that this month is, uh, of November is toned in a very uh, strong way by the recent new moon in Scorpio, which was opposed to Uranus in the sign of Taurus. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that because I did a whole new moon in Scorpio video on that very topic recently, which you can go back and look at in my YouTube archives. It's, a, it's like a full hour on the way in which that transit is toning the entire month of November. So I don't want to do a repeat on that. <clears throat> a lot of good content there. Be sure to check that out. Meanwhile, Maybe the biggest transit to start the month of November with is Mercury's retrograde. Let's go ahead and take a look at this. So you're going to see Mercury uh, retrograde at the very beginning of November. November 1st is indeed when it turns retrograde. And that's happening in the sign of Scorpio. Uh, that retrograde takes us all the way to November 21st, roughly. So you've got about three full weeks, the average time of a Mercury retrograde, to uh, be dealing with Mercury's retrograde in the sign of Scorpio. Now, in a just kind of generic way, Mercury's retrograde in the sign of Scorpio is um, something that can be talked about in terms of the uh, investigation into deep, hidden, secretive, and emotionally charged content, sometimes from the past, sometimes present. Sometimes it indicates the revelation of hidden uh, information or even secretive forms of communication or just really digging into something research wise and getting to the bottom of it. And the reason for this is that it's a, it's an autumnal water sign. So it's very contemplative and deep and uh, probing. And it is also the sign of Mars. And so it's very analytical. When you put those th two things together, it's like, you know, the research that you need to do to write a good spy movie. It's the, it's the investigative research of a detective or a forensic you know, a uh, specialist at the scene of a crime or something like that. But also it has to do with exploring the unconscious, um, even dreams or to a certain extent, the subtext in our relationships, that stuff that comes through in between the lines of what we say to one another. So you can watch for that during these three weeks. Perhaps more specifically, what I find really interesting about this particular retrograde is that for most of the life of the retrograde, check this out, and then uh, this will make a little bit more sense if I draw it out. I'll just put it forward a few days. And what I want you to notice is that right in the middle of this retrograde, you're going to see Mercury moving retrograde backward into a trine with Neptune, Neptune and Pisces. So not only is this a pretty deep and potentially very reflective and kind of critical time of thinking uh, all at once. So deep, analytical, maybe a little broody, um, also looking into hidden matters, uh, contemplating things that are more unseen or even more unheard like gossip or rumors. Water signs were originally called mute, which pointed to a secretiveness that was um, related to water signs, all of them, not just Scorpio. Um, but then when you add in the Mars element of Scorpio, you also get this cutting analytical quality, as well as the potential for more intense emotional, mental, communicative exchanges. And what the retrograde really signifies is a time of reversals. The normal plot line in some area of your life is just being, you know, turned around or flipped on its head a little bit. So 
the fact that all month long we're dealing three weeks out of November, we're dealing with this Mercury retrograde and then in throw in Neptune in the mix. And you're adding to that, this really imaginative dimension where Neptune is the Neptune's the kind of planet that is going to ask you what's real and what is uh, an illusion. Neptune is going to fill our, our minds, let's say our communication, our thoughts, whatever deeper probing we might be doing, uh, whatever in, interior intense emotional mental dynamics might be filling our lives it's going to also fill it with the longing for transcendence with the need to go very deep with the the interest in things that are magical mythical metaphorical subtle uh timeless boundaryless so that energy will also be really present throughout all three weeks of the retrograde so those are a few things to think about with mercury's retrograde this month Simple way of interpreting it is always to just look at the whole sign house that it's taking place in in your birth chart, but I'll be doing that a little bit in those horoscopes that I mentioned. Now, um, when we go forward, another thing at the very beginning of the month, of course, is that Venus is moving into Sagittarius. I won't show this one to you guys, but pretty simple transit. Venus entering Sagittarius at the very beginning of the month, getting a bump, right? Venus is moving out of uh, her exile or her detriment. Uh, in Scorpio, it's a little bit more of a conflicted place when Mars is in Venus's signs of Taurus and Libra, or when Venus is in Mars's signs of Aries and Scorpio. The Mars-Venus dynamic is more tense and a little bit more conflicted. Now, lately, we have had the benefit of Mars being in Libra, which gives Mars and Venus mutual reception despite their debility. So good things can come out of the Mars-Venus tension right now. But it will feel a lot different at the first of the month when Venus enters Sagittarius because Venus is entering a Jupiter-ruled sign. What was one of the traditional ways that ancient uh, astrologers had of interpreting Venus in Jupiter's sign or Jupiter in Venus's sign? A simple one was benefits from women. Why? Well, because Venus is a signifier of women. And uh, when it's in Jupiter's sign, it will receive benefits because Jupiter is the natural planet of benefits and blessings. So when you see Venus jump into Sagittarius, it's actually a pretty exciting thing. Venus, of course, can signify love, becoming a bit more upbeat and Jupiterian. It can include topics like justice for women, Jupiter being a sign of morality and uprightness and virtue and uh, Venus being a sign of women. It can be about blessings and, and romance, romantic blessings or uh, benefits coming in through relationships or partnerships. The point is that Venus is getting out of Mars's sign and getting a nice like kind of Jupiterian bump. So watch for that at the beginning of the month. Now that goes on all month long and there'll be a Venus transit later in the month we'll talk about that's pretty exciting. But that's, that's the first one. Now, the next major transit that's happening at the beginning of November between the 1st and the 5th, and I'm going to go ahead and share this one again so that you can see it. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so here um, we're looking at the square between Mars and Pluto, and that's happening. Now, I have this rolled up to November 9th, so let me pull it back a little bit so you can see it. Uh, in between the 1st and the 5th, Mars in Libra is moving into a square with Pluto in Capricorn. So you can see that there. And this is a dynamic that's coming on the heels of Mars having been square to Saturn. So what, you know, I I've spoke at length this uh, past month of October about the Mars-Saturn square. You can also go back and check that out if you want a little bit more context because they're really part of the same transit. But what can be said about this transit? Well, a few things. First of all, when Mars is square to Pluto, you're talking about the potential for assertion, strength, and will to gain Plutonic intensity, which means it's deep, it's more explosive, it feels more regenerating. You know what it's like to do work that you hate versus like, you know, working out and feeling like, you know, you're burning calories and all of a sudden you hit that breakthrough and you feel amazing. Mars Pluto is about in some ways, the potential for our work to gain that kind of Plutonian feeling of power, vigor, depth, potency, regenerative force. So that's there and that's a positive. On the flip side of that, Mars's square to Pluto can indicate the deadening of work or the deadening of will, or it can even represent um, ways in which the will is being 
manipulated by subterranean forces or, for example, the will to power, the will to, uh, especially with Libra, sometimes Mars and Libra is like a, a mediator right? And they have to make a tough executive decision. They have to be the one who executes, executing Mars and making the decision or making a judgment, Libra. And sometimes that's not easy because it's a Venus sign. You're looking for peace, but you might have to do something that's a little aggressive or assertive. This is also about the hand of justice and um, manipulations potentially of justice, as well as manipulations of the power of a mediator or the power of the courts or the power of the legal system, because Pluto can also represent this kind of subterranean uh, demonic drive, right? And so it can take over Mars and Libra and be about, you know, trying to assert power in ways that are, you know, corrupt or uh, trying to leverage a position that's supposed to be used to execute fairness and twisting it in, in some way that makes it, um, you know, really selfish or where there's some ulterior motive. So you do want to be a little bit careful and be careful that you're not getting co-opted by that, right? One thing that's really common during Libra transits is to triangulate. Uh, Liz Green wrote about this very famously and always stuck with me. Um, the triangulation dynamic with Libra is sometimes about uh, when we have a hard time making up our minds or being committed to something, we often triangulate with two people, right? So I tell you one thing, I tell you know, Susan, the another thing. And when I'm with Susan, I don't like you. And when I'm with you, I don't like Susan, right? And I'm playing you two off from each other like this. And sometimes that happens with Libran planets and Libran dynamics, specifically because the sign is sort of famous for weighing options and having to make, dis, dis, you know, wise judgments. And actually, it's a sign that is learning how, you know, sometimes planets in that sign reflect the difficulty doing that or that we're having to learn how to do that, but it's not easy. So when Mars is in uh, Libra and is making the square to Pluto, you also have to think about potential abuses of, of power or feeling like you need to do something, but it's a really hard decision to make and, and that it's a Plutonian decision to make. There's intense consequences. Diplom diplomatic uh di diplomatic challenges right so that's the first to the fifth and that's a big transit so i wanted to spend a little bit more time with that now between the sixth and the eighth let me show you this one between the sixth and the eighth of the month the sun in scorpio is going to be moving through a trine with uh neptune in pisces and on the sixth this will be kicked off well the moon is also in pisces so you'll see this little window of time where you've got a moon or excuse me, a sun um, Neptune trine. So what is that one all about? That's a, it's a really neat little window. It's going to pick up a sextile to they're picking up sextiles. The sun is to um, uh, Saturn as Saturn and Neptune in a, tr in a sextile with one another right now as well. A little Saturn in there as well, but let's just keep it simple and start with the sun Neptune. The sun Neptune is that feeling of gaining a kind of a, a glimpse beyond the veil that's inspiring. Trines are of the nature of Jupiter. So the trine is going to be uplifting, positive, beneficial. It's going to put some wind in your sails. And how? Through the, the probing, insightful, but maybe cutting uh, wisdom of the sun in Scorpio, connecting with the transcendental otherworldliness of Neptune. It's a great time to gain clarity, to gain vision, to gain a deeper, more... Um, real or authentic understanding of something, to probe, to ask deep questions, and to receive deep insight. Um, it's good for visionary art. It has a, also a feeling around um, potential, like the Jupiter, it's pretty slick. So you're going to be careful about deception or people in leadership or power who are pulling the wool over our eyes uh, or doing that to ourselves. The trine is pretty positive, but it can indicate some degree of aggrandizement or inflation. With the sun and Neptune, sometimes that's sort of like, you know, the uh, the cult leader playing the, uh, pi like the Pied Piper or whatever, you know, uh, 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 some, some kind of, uh, some kind of seductive pull to someone bright and, and luminous. And, and you have to be careful with this one because um, you can meet an inspiring figure uh, an inspiring leader, but you also have to pay close attention to what they're actually saying and, and, you know, 
the measure of a person is really the actions and their, their track record in terms of like, you know, being who they say they are and practicing whatever they preach. So be especially mindful about people, like charismatic people showing up in your life, whether it's a lover, teacher, someone at work, um, maybe really inspiring people that you come across by that at that time, but also the potential for a little bit of deception or uh, not seeing things entirely clearly with Neptune. Now, moving on from there, the next big one that I have on my list after that is on the 12th, which is the full moon. So let's take a look at that. Now, the full moon is going to come through and we're going to see the full moon. Um, oops. Here we go. So you're going to see the full moon in Taurus opposite Sun, Mercury retrograde. Of course, Mercury retrograde at that time is picking up the trine to Neptune, as I was saying. Um, now, the full moon in Taurus is really an interesting moment of, um, I guess I would call it a balancing moment, um, because obviously the needs of a full moon in Taurus are really different than where the month starts off with the explosive um, opposition, really, between uh, the new moon in Scorpio and Uranus and Taurus. So the full moon on the 12th in the sign of Taurus will provide people with uh, the Venusian, uh, or, or, or what I should say is that it will press the Venusian agenda on us a little bit. And what is the Venusian agenda in earthy sign like Taurus? Looking for more stability, looking for peace, looking for happiness, looking for contentment and material satisfaction. It is looking for some sense of power, strength, normalcy, productivity, practical beauty. That's in direct contrast to a lot of the emphasis placed in Scorpio and in the, the watery sign of Mars. Much more broody, moody, confrontational, emotional, oriented towards change and transformation through confrontation. The full moon comes through and says, let's press the pause button and make sure that we're getting some ground beneath our feet, making sure to enjoy this moment and, and, and looking for deeper and perhaps even more practical forms of security and, and stability. Basic full moon and Taurus stuff, right? So watch for that around the 12th. Now, the, the fact that um, it's interesting, right? Because Uranus is in Taurus right now. One more thing we should add here. Because Uranus is also in Taurus right now, the full moon is also about trying to, the stabilization that we might be looking for is related, as I mentioned in the new moon video that I made, to an overarching desire to create a new paradigm or to create a new structure, which we are hoping will be stabilizing. Um, so there's been revolution in the air, but the, part of the revolution with Uranus and Taurus is Let's move towards a stabler, more enjoyable, uh, more sustainable situation. That's kind of the impetus behind all of this. So the full moon will also uh, amplify that need to, okay, am I, am I transforming toward something that is peaceful, durable, stable, lovely, Torian? Okay, now the next transit that's coming through is between the 11th and the 16th. And that transit is the square between Venus and Sagittarius and Neptune and Pisces. So let's look at that one. Here we are right in the midst of it. Excuse me. And um, so the 11th to the 16th. So here's Venus in Sagittarius making the square to Neptune in Pisces. Now when we're doing a monthly breakdown like this, by the way, we are not looking at house positions. We're talking about mundane transits in a general way and giving you the archetypal core of the transit and saying, watch for this, watch for these kinds of dynamics, apply as you will. They're not, this is not a, we don't need to plug these into houses. This is, this would be an, you know, abstract house system from roughly the area that I live in in Maryland, right? So we're not looking at houses. So don't worry about that piece just because I get that question every time. All right. So Venus, Neptune, well, between the 11th and the 16th, Venus squared to Neptune is going to bring with it a wave of the same romantic um, and kind of up upbeat, expansive energy around Venusian things that we started off talking about when we said that Venus is entering Sagittarius, Jupiter's sign. 
that's nice because now we've got Venus and Sag, Neptune and Pisces. It's the dream to, you know, to up mostly, you know, benefic situation, two planets in Jupiter's sign, Venus, the benefic hitting through Sag. This is that kind of moment where, you know, art, music, glamour, fashion, fame, romance, um, the desire to reach beyond this world into a, into a paradise, into a paradise lost. That's the longing of Neptune. Venus fills us with otherworldly love when it connects with Neptune. Divine discontent, nothing is quite good enough. That can be a strain when, when there's a square between these two planets. Venus in Sagittarius um, is also game for adventure. It's something I didn't mention at the beginning. Venus in Sagittarius loves a, a good adventure, a good thrill ride. Um, Jupiter in the fire sign is in the sign of the centaur, right? So Venus and Neptune can be uh, about beauty and art and romance and love and friendship and adventure. Sometimes it's like, uh, you know, like a, what do you call it? A space opera, like a, um, a sci-fi, a, a sci-fi love romance. The, the feeling is one of expansion, grace, beauty, otherworldliness. However, Venus square Neptune can also be about the illusion of fame. Uh, it can be an inflated transit where you spend way too much money on something. It turns out that it's not even real gold, that, you know, that kind of dynamic. So Venus square to Neptune between the 11th and 16th, I think, you know, like genuinely, it's one of the harder transits to not get swept up by because generally speaking, we do really good sitting in our center when the difficult transits come, when the good ones come, it's very easy to be like, cool, like, give me, <laughs> give me like, you know, um, what's the, uh, in this one, in this case, I'm thinking of the song by Justin Timberlake, uh, which was on a album that he had some time ago called spaceship coop. I don't know if you guys ever heard that song, but it, it cracks me up every time. I'm like, I don't even remember how I heard this song. I think my, my wife and I were driving, um, somewhere on vacation and, um, we had nothing. We accidentally forgot music. We were in a Starbucks and we picked up his album because we were like, well, this will at least give us something to listen to because we don't we just weren't into the radio for whatever reason. So we listened to the whole album. And we were like, wow, you know, it's pretty good. And, and, and uh, this was the one with um, Bowtie, I want to say. I can't remember. Anyway, so there's this whole song that he wrote about taking some girl in a, in a spaceship <laughs> You know, like a really hot spaceship convertible ride to the moon. <laughs> so that's Venus Neptune, right? But you can also get totally lost in it. <laughs> By the end of that song, there's like all of these fake orgasm noises going <laughs> going up like crazy. And uh, it just cracked my wife and I up. We, you know, we were, <laughs> I don't I feel like you can never be too young for some pop music or too old for some pop music. But that even for us was a little cheesy. Anyway, so be careful of Justin Timberlake coming to take you away in a spaceship convertible between the 11th and the 16th. Okay, otherwise, you know, on the 16th, there's also this really interesting signature, which is uh, a grand water trine. I'm not going to show it, but grand water trine with the moon in Cancer, Mercury, Scorpio, and Neptune in Pisces. Really potent, kind of emotional, emotive day with Venus squaring Neptune. So real kind of otherworldliness right in the middle of the month. Um, maybe I'll do a YouTube video at that time and try to re reconstruct a, a spaceship coop that we can all fly away in. All right. Uh, emotional time though, on the 16th with the grand water trine, um, d deeper stuff around women, family, communication, spirituality, uh, middle of the month. Now on the 21st, Mercury turns direct. That's good news because then we're getting the, um, the, turnaround, so to speak, of the uh, heavy, watery Mars energy, because right after that, Sun enters Sagittarius, hits a Jupiter sign. Not long after that, Mercury's going to go direct, start moving, uh, moving forward. Yet Mars has moved into Scorpio uh, uh, during, this, uh, during the month ahead. Uh, so there is um, still Mars to deal with in Scorpio, but just getting, when you get a, when you get a long period of time, there's a lot of planets moving through Scorpio, you know what I mean? Like it just gets, there's just more of a heaviness. Like it feels like you're living in the, in the like realm of uh, twin peaks or something for a while. So, you know, Mercury turning director on the 21st can also culminate in 
reversals for the positive if you've been delayed with something, if you've been hitting setbacks, if you've been dealing with a heavier period emotionally, mentally, et cetera, uh, any delays, again, the turnaround can mean that there's forward m movement, that you're integrating lessons learned, et cetera. So that's, you know, that's nice. Now, what comes after that, interestingly, it, another uh, Scorpio transit I want to hit really quick um, is <clears throat> Mars is going to be moving through the opposition uh, to Uranus on the 24th. So here is Mars in Scorpio hitting the opposition to Uranus and Taurus. That happens on the 24th, only a couple of days after, um, the, after Mercury turns direct and while the moon is also in Scorpio, which is pretty intense. That 24th, um, what, what are you going to watch for around that one? 24th transit with Mars opposite Uranus and the moon in Scorpio and Mercury having just turned direct in Scorpio, a breakthrough. Mars opposite Uranus is a moment of aggression, force, muscle, strength, will, courage, bravery, hitting the planet of revolution, change, that Promethean impulse to awaken, free, ascend. So it's, it's pretty explosive though with Mars in Scorpio, very strong Mars placement in its home domicile. Uh, with Mercury having just turned direct, feels like a kind of like punch through to another level kind of moment. You got to be really careful about blowing up. This is a transit that can be very explosive, very violent, actually. And so, um, you know, this is the kind of thing where Mars opposite Uranus, there will be a big accident in the news somewhere, right? I hate to say it, but that's you can almost put money on it that there's going to be a train derailing or, you know, some some form of technology, right, that goes off the rails or some kind of sudden attack or some kind of unexpected, uh, you know, electrical meltdown that re results in a fire. It's Mars opposite Uranus can be like that. Now, I want to tone that down, back that up a step because you know, for most of us, it's not going to be that. But I'm just saying, just kind of consider yourself to be someone who is like um, uh, emotionally irresponsible at that time. Be like, okay, right now, <laughs> like I am not the most emotionally responsible person in the world. I could fly off the handle here. Just if you think about it a little bit like that, just kind of cautioning yourself um, and also telling yourself, I'm emotionally mature and I can, <laughs> I can deal with this. I don't know how good it is to tell yourself that you're, you know, that you're, uh, <laughs> you're an emotional, emotionally loose cannon. But I'm just saying, just treat yourself like you could be <laughs> and be careful because that's the kind of moment where you can kind of, you know, you can, you can smoke someone <laughs> unintentionally. And the other thing is, this is not the time to engage in like road rage or any kind of like, potentially more volatile exchange with other people because it can it can get you know it can, it can get medieval pretty quickly anyway um so mars opposite uranus also the assertion of freedom the need to um strengthen one's individual position or views even if they go against the status quo that kind of energy is real strong around november 24th now, <clears throat> the other last transit that I want to talk about is the, uh, a series of transits happening in Sagittarius toward the end of the month. So you can see this one right here around the 24th, uh, which is the, on the same day of the Mars opposite Uranus dynamic. And maybe this is kind of a silver lining in terms of things really flying off the tracks, but 28 degree Sagittarius. Look at that. That is a beautiful venus jupiter conjunction and let me tell you right now watch watch how this works right let's keep our eye on venus jupiter and let's revolve the clock a little bit so here's the sun you can see that the sun is just below the descendant which is the western horizon right here so hanging in the western sky just after sunset um gonna give you like an hour or so uh, building up to this you'll see it all month you'll see venus approaching uh, Jupiter, but watch that because that is going to be, it's going to be like a, a big sparkling, beautiful gem of a uh, conjunction in the sky. You'll see the two lights close together, just boom, you can't miss it. It's a real nice light show to check out. Those are our two benefics, our two good doers, and they're getting together on the 24th. And then two days later on the 26th, 
we have a new moon in Sagittarius in Jupiter's sign. And uh, Jupiter's culminating in Sagittarius as well. So what does that mean? Well, the good news is that for as intense as that Mars opposite Uranus transit will be towards the end of the month, the 21st through the 26th, there's also a Venus-Jupiter conjunction with a new moon in Sagittarius. All Jupiter, Jupiter, Jupiter. So what can you expect from that? Well, first of all, when Venus and Jupiter get together, you get blessings. You get blessings from women, from friends, from love, from relationships. Uh, you get blessings from allies. You get positive social connections. You get aggrandizement around things like wealth, beauty, jewelry, fashion. You get Venus, Jupiter is, uh, because centaur, uh, the cent <laughs> because the centaur in, <laughs> because the centaur in Sagittarius is generally game for a party. It's also like it's it's more upbeat, adventurous Venus Jupiter dynamic. Venus Jupiter dynamics, by the way, often result in things like, you know, spending too much, eating too much, going over the the top somehow, especially around things that you're trying to do for pleasure. Um, so it can be that kind of wealthy, materialistic, greedy, vain. Got to be careful of that. That's the shadow side. But on the positive note, this is like boom. It's it's nice and big, and it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, how much abundance and support can come through a Venus-Jupiter conjunction. So watch for that. It's a time of great optimism as well. And then the new moon in Sagittarius, the last new moon cycle, full cycle of, the, of 2019 in a Jupiter-ruled sign of Sagittarius. We are, um, the theme of the month ahead will also be about the uh, expansive themes of Jupiter. But December, that's going to shift a little bit because Jupiter is going to jump into Capricorn where it's in its fall. So... The Jupiter themes are going to get a little dicey in December. We'll be talking about that next month. But the basic thing with that I can tell you now is that what Jupiter traditionally represented morality, cosmic order, cosmic goodness, virtue, etc. When it hits Saturn sign, sometimes it's about the fall or collapse of the moral, legal integrity. It, it is about uh, failures of Jupiter or it's about the desire to start some new order or new system just because of the failings of an old one. It's a more conflicted transit we're dealing with Jupiter in December. But the end of November, especially with Venus conjoined Jupiter, it's a really nice, pretty sweet, uplifting energy. So should be good. All right, so that's what I've got for you guys. But I want to direct you to uh, one last thing, which is my upcoming course. So on November 16th, I start my next Ancient Astrology for the Modern Mystic course. It is a one-year certification course in Ancient Hellenistic Astrology. If you are have been studying astrology for a while but have never studied Ancient Astrology, Hellenistic Astrology, I promise you, even though some of the curriculum, if you look over it on my website, may look sort of introductory, I promise you've never learned it before. You just have to trust me on that because Ancient Astrology's way of teaching houses, signs, planets, aspects is completely different from what people have been taught in modern astrology. It's very deep kind of karmic science. It's very beautiful. And it's a, it's a nice, deep, structured way of learning an incredibly um, accurate form of astrology. You can, if you've watched my channel a while, you know, you probably learned a bit more about ancient astrology by this point. But if you haven't, and you're just looking for a way of really developing a, a strong foundation in astrology, uh, starting with ancient astrology, starting with where it all started is a great place to start. So I really encourage you guys to check that out. If you've been studying for a while, I promise it will blow your mind. Your astrology practice will get a lot better. If you're brand new to astrology, brand, brand new, you're getting into it. You're just starting to learn planets, signs, houses, etc. cetera. Uh, again, it's a great structured year long course that can help you take everything to the next level. People sometimes take the course for professional reasons. They might want to read for other people on some part-time, full-time basis, or they may just want to uh, take it for spiritual reasons. People take the course all the time just because it's their hobby. They love astrology. And hey, it's an amazing thing to be able to read your own chart and have that as a, you know, being able to read your own chart is like, like having a map that a lot of people don't have to deal with the ups and downs of life. So maybe the simplest benefit of studying astrology. Uh, there are 30 classes on the year plus 12 guest lectures. They are two to three hour classes each. They meet live via webinar, but you can participate remotely if you can't make it live. They meet on Saturdays starting November 16th. They run from, like I said, noon to about two to three o'clock p.m. in the afternoon. Um, there is optional homework, bonus material, quizzes, Facebook forum. You can interact with me all year through email. 
It's a great course. There's a certification course uh, test at the end if you want to try to be certified. You don't have to be either. Uh, I also offer a year two program and a course in horary astrology, which is also a classical predictive method. So uh, if any of that appeals to you, I'd love to have you in class. The early bird discount for this program ends as of November 1st. So you only have like two more days to take advantage of it. I'm, it's the 29th when I'm recording this right now. Uh, so hopefully some of you will join, but um, you can sign up and register with the full tuition and a 12 month payment plan, which is um, a bit more, but um, you can do that anytime up until the 16th. And if you're applying for need-based tuition because you are in a financial um, uh crisis of some kind, or you have a very limited budget, you're on disability or a single parent, whatever the case might be, um, you can also register in that way all the way up until the 16th if I have space open. It's almost full. Um, the uh, way to check this out is go to the certification course tab on my website, which is nightlightastrology.com. Nightlightastrology.com. Okay. Thanks for listening, everyone. And I hope you guys have a great month of November. Please leave your comments in the comment section and tell me how the astrology is unfolding for you as the month goes along. Okay. Take care.